Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone, on a Tuesday evening discussing uh, doctrinal development, and not necessarily just doctrinal development itself, but also can doctrine change? Can it be reversed? Can it be undone? Of course, by the magisterium, not by any individuals. Uh, of course, joined by co-host Eric Ivar, Roman Catholic, and also returning guest, Dr. Uh, Eduardo Echeverria. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Always a pleasure to be with you guys. Yeah, it's great to have you again. I, I was looking forward to this because this is a topic I've been looking into a lot myself just because um, somebody pointed me to an article that Trent Horn um, did on whether or not doctrine can change. Right. And so I was interacting with that material. I did a video and a paper responding to it. And I, right. and I take the position that there is a qualified sense in which doctrine can change in non-definitive teachings in rare instances. And I would say that Simony perhaps uh, was one of them. I don't know if you would agree with me or not, but from what I understand, I, I want to say you hold the thesis that doctrine is reversible, that the magisterium can, in some qualified senses, um, change or reverse doctrine. I, is that accurate? Well, uh, I, I want to say on its face, no. I, I would put it this way. I think you can have a, a reversal of certain teaching. So, mm -hmm. uh, and that teaching, that teaching, uh, I would say, is third level teaching. So, mm -hmm. so remember, you have all these uh, theological notes that qualify right. certain teaching, and so you have, uh, uh, you know, two levels of teaching that, uh, such that the teaching uh, is infallible. Okay, right. I, I don't remember whether I said this last time, but it's always important to understand that infallibility refers to the uh, the the teaching activity of the church when it ascribes the highest degree of certainty to a proposition that it already knows to be true. Infallibility doesn't make anything true. Mm -hmm. The church doesn't make anything true. It doesn't it doesn't create truth. Okay, right. So when it when it when it so you have two, for, for different reasons, but you have two, uh, a, a primary and a secondary object of infallibility. Mm -hmm. um, there can be uh, a development there. There can be a deepening in our understanding right. of, of the church's teaching. Um, but there can't be a change. Even with respect to if we introduce the third level where, you know, the thir third level teachings, for instance, are teachings of... Um, you know, ecumenism and even religious liberty, uh, the church, the church did reverse itself here. But the reversal did not result in a change in the fundamental teachings of the church on ecclesiology. So even though the church um, reversed itself on ecclesiology, I, I, you know, I can give a, an explanation of that, uh, and reversed itself on religious liberty, that did not involve a change in the fundamental teaching of the, of the church on ecclesiology, nor a fundamental teaching, a fundamental change in the church's teaching on the relationship between freedom and truth. Now, those those are in reference to, as you say, fundamental teachings. Those teachings that are definitive. Those are in fact, and, exactly. and and there's no dispute there, no no doubt. First and second level paragraph teachings. Are definitive cannot be reversed, right. but those third level non definitive teachings are reversal. Um, There's no question. But not only reverse, is there in, in fact instances in which they can actually be overturned and taught the opposite of? No, I would say this. Um, here, this is my explanation, which I've given in several uh, uh, contexts, but. Um, there's a surface contradiction between the 1928 encyclical of Pius XI, Mortalium Animus, mm -hmm. and the decree on ecumenism, and later John Paul II's uh, 95 Ut Unum Sin. There's a surface contradiction there. And the surface contradiction is that Pius denies ecumenism, and the decree on ecumenism affirms ecumenism. However, However, there, there are certain things that you have to consider here in, um, in understanding 
in, in trying to show that the surface contradiction in the end is only a surface contradiction, that it's not a real contradiction. It's not a real contradiction. And, and this is where I say two things. In the first place, you have to consider the historical context in which pious uh, uh, rejected ecumenism, uh, the historical context in which mortalium animus was uh, promulgated. And this is particularly so when the, the statements are polemical and antithetical. All truth formulated, I would say, for polemical reasons is going to be partial. It's going to be inadequate. It's not going to be wrong. It's not going to be false, but it's going to be partial, albeit true. And this means that what these documents fail to say is not necessarily denied. Furthermore, what they did say, albeit insufficiently and imperfectly, must be interpreted with respect to the full doctrine and the full life of the church. So if you put Pius back in the historical, if you put that encyclical back in its historical context, I would, I would, I would argue that everything that Pius rejected about ecumenism, Vatican II in the decree on ecumenism still rejected. It rejected an ecclesial relativism or an ecclesial pluralism. That is the idea that there are many churches or a multiple subsistence ecclesiology. It rejected the branch theory of Christianity in which Christianity is the trunk and then you have all these branches, you know, Catholicism maybe being the biggest branch, but uh, orthodoxy and then in, the, in an American context, Presbyterianism, whether it's Orthodox Presbyterianism or Reform Presbyterianism or the Presbyterian Church of America or Presbyterian Church USA or whatever, Lutherans, you know, Missouri Synod Lutherans, the Evangelical Lutherans. No, the... the uh, Mortalium animus and the decree in ecumenism rejects the branch theory of Christianity. It rejects re reconciliation without repentance because it distinguishes between uh, division and diversity, division and theological diversity. But most significantly, it rejects the idea that, uh, you know, we confess credo in unum ecclesium, you know, that the one church is something that comes out of dialogue, out of, a, out of a, you know, the diversity of, of interlocutors, we hope to arrive at some kind of unity. Unfortunately, Francis sometimes gives the impression that that's what ecumenism is about. Well, you know, mortalium animus rejects that, Vatican II rejects that, and it rejects that because it affirms that the church that Christ founded subsists in its own right alone in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has the fullness of the means of salvation. Now, that doesn't mean, so we have to avoid that. We, ha we must avoid drawing the conclusion then that, uh, that outside the visible boundary of the church, all you have is, you know, a wasteland, uh, an ecclesial wasteland or emptiness, etc. No, the church says, and... Lumen Gentium 8, that there, and also the decree in ecumenism, that there are elements of truth and sanctification outside the visible boundary of the church. But that does not mean that the church now accepts an ecclesial relativism or pluralism as if to say that there are many churches. So Catholic ecumenism begins always with the one church, which is the Catholic church. But then, of course, it has to try to account for ecclesial unity and diversity within the one church. What's the relationship between the one church, which is the Catholic church, of course, that evokes opposition from Protestants. That's the scandal of particularity regarding uh, regarding the church, you know. Um, so you have to give an, an explanation of ecclesial unity and diversity, whether there can be legitimate theological diversity. Uh, I, I think there can be, and I think that the Korean ecumenism allows us to say that, both in paragraph 4 and paragraph 17. I, you know, I always quote paragraph 17 because it's, it makes the distinction between truth and its formulations. You know, Hark, re referring us back to John the 23rd, you know, the distinction between, you know, the, 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 
the, the, the revealed truth of our sacred teaching. And uh, it's one thing, the mode of expression, it's an mode of enunciation is another thing. And then there's that subordinate clause according to the same meaning and the same judgment of truth. Huh? So the alternative formulation has to be complementary. It has to keep the same meaning. It has to mediate the same meaning and the same judgment of truth. This is uh, John the 23rd quoting uh, Vatican Council I in the, the Vatican Constitution Dei Filius, and Vatican Council I is quoting uh, Vincent of Lorenz from the Commendatorium Premium, Chapter 23. So there's a place for saying, and that's what ecumenism is. Ecumenism is an exchange of gifts. It's not merely an exchange of ideas. It's an exchange of gifts. Why? Because some, it's not surprising, paragraph 17 says, if one tradition or another has a more apt appreciation of some aspect of the revealed mystery. And that, that appreciation is at the level of formulation. It's not at the level of gift. It's not that, it's not that I, I, you know, my standard example is, is, is Kuyper's, uh, Abraham Kuyper's, uh, the Dutch Reform Theology, uh, is Theology of the Lordship of Christ. You know, I'm writing a review of it. It's a three-volume work. Well, uh, yes, we also have, we have a solemnity on the Lordship of Christ. But I dare say that Kuyper has thought more about the Lordship of Christ uh, than, than most Catholics have. So I, I'm not sitting there at Mass when, and the Solemnity of Christ, and I'm waiting to hear some uh, some reflections on, on Christ's Lordship, and it, and it ain't coming. It doesn't come. So Kuiper deepens our understanding of Christ's Lordship, and in that respect, his formulations are complementary to Catholic teaching. We can receive those formulations as a gift, and those formulations bring about a fuller a fuller unity between us bring about a fuller a fuller uh, catholicity you know um, so it seems to me that that's uh, it's it's very important so Pius the 11th if you put him back in its historical context everything he rejected Vatican II rejected but Pius's reaction to given his historical context Pius's reaction to ecumenism was one-sided he never asked himself the question, well, what is ecumenism? How do we understand, you know, the relationship between ecclesial unity and diversity? So I think, I think, uh, you know, uh, Congar's book, I think it's a great book, uh, True and False Reform um, in the Church. I think he helps us to see that, that the Church sometimes does not, uh, uh, is one-sided in its response what it says is correct but it's one-sided in its response because it never asked the question it never recognized that there were an element of truth in what you know these uh ecumenical the, the ecumenical movement in the early 20th century was trying to get at it was trying to take seriously you know john john 17 the the ecumenical imperative of christ that they all may be one and so on yeah, when I when I read when I read Mortalium Animus and uh, reread it, reread it, Pius is referring to the the theory or the belief that all these different religions can come together because. Oh, okay, so there, let, me, let me just interrupt you. They're not different religions. These are Christians. Ecumenism has to do with Christians. Right, right. But at, at the the first paragraph, he talks in general about different beliefs where, you know, people of different denominations can all, on a sub-level agreement of doctrine, can come to be that unity that, that Christ prays for in John 17. And that's the kind of ecclesial relativism that he's, he's working with bold-faced ecclesial relativism I, uh, absolutely but that's all that's also rejected by vatican II. right yeah so 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 i guess my point here is that when pope pius says no to ecumenical meetings because today we hear this ad nauseum that oh you know the catholic church clearly changed its teaching because 
before they were against the ecumenical movement. Now they're for the ecumenical movement. But here's the problem. The Catholic Church was against the ecumenical movement because they saw a one-to-one -one relationship between ecclesial relativism and ecumenical meetings. Exactly. And they didn't realize that there's actually a way to have ecumenical meetings while retaining ecclesial absolutism. I agree. That's exactly right. And that's what it seems to me. They, Pius didn't realize that because he didn't ask himself the question, well, what was, what was, what was, remember, if you, again, you put it back in its historical context, of course, that's the only understanding of ecumenism that, that was available to him. Right. You know, that one, as you said, that, that uh, promoted ecclesial pluralism or relativism. Uh, what's his name? Um, I think there, there, there are two things here. One, I, I, I quote, uh, I quote Burkauer here because Burkauer makes this. He too makes the distinction between the truth and its formulations, the the context and the content, and he says the import of this distinction is that it implies that the church's formulation of the truth could have, for various reasons, actually occasion misunderstandings of the truth itself. In other words, the formulation or expression itself of the truth could be characterized by one-sidedness such that it is not elevated above the historical relativity in its analysis of the rejected error. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it never asks the question, Congar will go on to say, um, you know, what were there, are there seeds of truth, Congar says, in, in what was rejected? In what was rejected and eventually of course not i mean this all preparation congar many others you know leading up to vatican ii leading up to the decree in ecumenism where it becomes clear that the church found a way ratzinger says to uh, you know to integrate uh, ecumenism uh, within the logic of catholicism within the first principle of catholic ecclesiology I think too many people, I think, for instance, I mean, this is this is a general point I, I, I would make, and that is, uh, you know, um, neo, well, people that I call neo-traditionalists, like uh, 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 Peter uh, Kawasinski and, uh, and, and Archbishop Schneider. Yeah, they Archbishop They don't Schneider. know how to deal with reversals. They don't know how to deal with reversals. They they only have one standard, continuity. And so then, so then of course, if you only have continuity, then they it seems to me they arbitrarily then tell us that uh, Pius the Eleventh mortalium animus is the standard. And so then, of course, when you get to the decree in ecumenism, and then later John Paul's Utunum Sint, you see you have to treat those as somehow. Uh, denying some essential truth yeah that, that to me is that to me uh seems to be problematic as well because uh for example the doctrine of papal infallibility um you know if you go into the patristic record you can find all these these all these statements saying you know rome is unblemished and rome is not going to err and this and that and the third um and it makes it sound like rome is really never going to have a condition where it could err. Mm -hmm. But then 19 centuries later, they're hashing this out and they say, well, there's some conditions where it's possible that he's fallible. And then there's this very isolated condition where he's not, uh, where he's infallible and he's protected from error. And uh, to me, that you can call it clarification. You can call it... Uh, development, you can call it a, a magnification of the substance of revelation. You can call it, you can, you know, you can come up with a lot of things, but there is some sort of change there because there were a lot of people who thought that uh, the patristic data taught that the Pope could never in well, any condition. There can be uh, correction, modification, uh, complementary formulations. Uh, even of uh, infallible teaching, uh, but it doesn't involve a change in the fundamental teaching. 
Can, can I propose two changes, not to fundamental teachings, but two changes? Um, now, one would be the Holy Office in the Preconciliar Church taught that public prayer with non-Catholics is a grave sin against divine law versus the, the post-conciliar church that says not only is it not a sin, it's to be fostered. And then number two, simony in the pre-conciliar church was understood, not even just pre-conciliar church, I'm sorry, up until about 1600s, was understood to encompass all interest, whereas after that it became a rejection of excess interest, not all interest. Those are two changes that I would submit that the magisterium has actually not only just reversed, but has contradicted itself. Yeah, but again, you have to ask yourself the question, uh, what's the status of that teaching? I don't see any reason why. I agree with you. Yeah, they're non-definitive. I agree with you. But yeah, so, that's my so, point. When, when we started, I was talking about non-definitive teachings that right. could be um, erroneous and changed. And, and I thought you said no, even even third level teachings that are non-definitive could not actually change. No, 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 not at all. Because I said okay. examples of non-definitive teaching were ecumenism and religious liberty. And the mm. church changed on, on those. It reversed itself on those matters. Mm. But I think it's very important to understand uh, that when it reversed itself on ecumenism, it did not change the fundamental uh, yeah. uh, the first principle of Catholic ecclesiology. There, it, yeah. That that remains the same. There's no change. Sure, sure. It now, is, let me ask you a follow-up question of, sure. about that. Okay. When they, when they, I, I agree with you maybe on the ecclesiology part, but to say that praying with um, non-Catholics in public is against divine law, all the way to say it should be fostered, how is that not perhaps a fundamental change? Well, because, again, the question is, what's the status of that teaching? Praying with, uh, I, you know, I'd have to go back to see yeah. uh, what were the reasons given why you couldn't pray. I mean, look, you have to put this in its historical context. There are all kinds of, uh, there are all kinds of uh, overreactions on the part of Catholics to Protestants. You know, we, we they, after the Reformation, you know, there's, uh, it's almost as if there's no recognition that we're, that we're actually brethren in Christ, you know. Well, the reason was to avoid scandal. I mean, that's what the Holy Office explicitly said. It's against divine law because this is going to cause scandal. Well, so, I, don't, I don't know what divine law they're referring to. What divine well, law yeah, yeah the, divine, the divine law that they were referring to in that passage in the Holy Office was uh, that that being a follower of some other religion that wasn't revealed by God. Well, that's the first mistake you're making because it's not another religion. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah so they, it's another religion. It's one thing if you're talking about Buddhists or Hindus or what Baha'i, but we're talking about Christians. If you go back and you read Luther and Calvin and, and uh, Zwingli and so on and so on, I mean, these people are Christians. You can't. But the Holy them. Office was talking about Christians. Well, they were talking about the. They were talking about schismatics. So, so you know, exactly. even exactly. schismatics that had a valid Eucharist, for example, that, right. that they were they were bringing. But at that time, what they were grounding their 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 the uh, uh, you know the prohibition on was the idea that if we go public standing side by side in public prayer uh, between an eastern orthodox and a roman catholic and a protestant what it visualizes or what it what what our out what our external is telling the in the world that is that's internal is that it's just as good to be well, then you have to explain. One has to explain himself. Uh, I would say that to me, to me, this example has nothing to do with doctrine. This has nothing to do with doctrine. These are these are prudential judgments that are made at periods of time, and uh, in those circumstances, you might be able to say, "I understand why the church was saying this." Yeah, because the fundamental doctrine was that it's not equally as good to be a Protestant. Oh, of course not. The church has never held that. So right. but the Holy Office at that point was assuming right away, if you put them together in prayer, you are telling the world that well, so it's just as good to in be that a historical context, when you put it in the historical context, the, it's, 
So let me be very clear. This has nothing to do with doctrine. What, what, what pertains to divine law does no, it, have to it has do with... nothing to do with doctrine. It's the application. It's it's a prudential judgment. And prudential... divine law is prudential. No, the judgment that is that was made saying yeah. that you can't pray with other Christians. Yeah. In that context, let's even assume that it's understandable why they said that. Mm. It would cause scandal because it's uh, it creates the idea of this a multiple we use a later term a multiple subsistence ecclesiology and ecclesial relativism and so on and so on. So of course, it seems to me to, to draw to draw the clearest comparison to this, praying with other Christians at that even at that time, I understand why they said that. It's not the same thing as interreligious prayer. And he, or even multi-religious prayer because that's praying with with non-Christians, okay? So and you that's taking place today, by the way. <laughs> well, it's not, well, okay. So it's it may be taking place today. It it seems to me uh, incorrectly, mm -hmm. uh, wrongly. Uh, you know. Um, so when Pope France, France, I'm sorry, when Pope Francis prays in a mosque alongside of Muslims, you would say that's wrong, correct? I would say that that's wrong. Okay. I would say that that's wrong. Okay. I would say and, yeah, that, yeah, the, but I would say in the case of uh, if we if we bring up the case of a CCUC, I, I, I don't agree with uh, with what uh, you know John Paul II did. Even if we enter all the qualifications about it not being interreligious but multi-religious and so on, yeah, the difference between Francis. And John Paul II is that John Paul II has a, theor a theological framework. He has a whole body of teaching that uh, where he gives an account of uh, you know a theology of religions and so on. And he's not a religious pluralist or anything of that sort. So one can disagree with the judgment, the practical prudential judgment of of you know of the the, the circumstance of interreligious prayer. And I do, with respect to even John Paul, but John Paul, there's no confusion there at the level of his theology. Um, I've argued this in many places, most recently in the second edition of my Francis book and the chapter on the dialogue of religions and the question of truth. In the case of Francis, I would say that even though he makes the distinction between evangelization and, uh, and dialogue, interreligious dialogue, uh, I think his approach uh, uh, fosters a sort of a de facto religious indifferentism uh, because he never raises the question of truth. And in fact, his whole understanding of truth, it seems to me, is flawed. He, he, he says several times, uh, several times, and I bring this up in that chapter and, and in an earlier context, he says, yes, of course, uh, we have to, in a religious dialogue, there are these two principles. We have to try to understand the, you know, to use Ratzinger's terms, the otherness of the other in his thinking. And we also have to begin by holding on to the fullness of our Christian commitment. But then he says, the one thing we have to renounce is, the, and it's incredible that he says this, and he says it several times, we have to renounce the idea that our beliefs are uh, uh, ex uh, uh, valid and absolute, that they're exclusively valid and absolute. Mm -hmm. And then I say to myself, well, how, how can that be? Right. He's not just saying, I, 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 I ask, well, is he just saying that, uh, you know, that you can find, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in religious texts through God's general revelation, you can find fragments of truth there and so on and so on so that's so that uh that's fine i mean i i i think that's right you can find fragments of truth there from god's general revelation from his uh uh you know from his moral remember c.s lewis in the in his book the abolition of man he's at the end of the book he in his appendix he cites all these uh moral precepts from traditions that have never heard of the ten commandments and of course and moral precepts of, that that overlap with the second table of the Decalogue, and uh, well, why are they there? Because God has not left Himself without witness. You know, the moral law 
Remember in, in Romans 2, St. Paul says that, you know, the law, the law is written on the hearts of men. Uh, those who, they don't have the Mosaic law, but the law is nevertheless presses down upon them and, right. and so on and so on. So all of these things, it seems to me, uh, is if that's all that Francis says, if, that, if that's all that he means, of course, then I agree with that. But that's not all that he means. How can you, how can you actually say that, that we have to uh, abandon, let me, let me quote him uh, uh, especially here. Because I know that somebody will say, like, somebody will say, oh, no, you know, you, you can't. You this, misunderstood him. Yeah. You, you've misunderstood him and blah, blah, blah. But no, uh, he says, and I discussed this both in the first chapter of my uh, the, the revised uh, uh, book, second edition, and then later in um uh, in the chapter in the dialogue of religions in the question of truth. And uh, he rejects the notion of absolute truth. Now, I think he's confused about that in his conversation with the, uh, you know, Eugenio Scalfari, you remember the, that octogenarian, octogenarian atheist. Right. And the thing here is if someone started to say to me, oh, well, how can you quote him? But I, I said, I'm not quoting him. Uh, Francis wrote, a, a letter called a letter to a non-believer where he says in that letter that uh, uh, a, a Scalfieri had asked him about whether about uh, whether there whether there is no absolute and therefore no absolute truth but only a series of relative and subjective truth and then Francis re replies to him he says to begin with I would not speak about absolute truths he says even for believers. Now, he goes on, and the, the, there's a whole paragraph here, and I try to unpack that, but that, it gets a little bit technical, so I'm not going to get it there. But later on, he, he says, he says, uh, let us not, I'm quoting him. This is not Scalfieri. This is Francis. This is before, before he's Pope, and then there's a quote later on, uh, the same, he says the same thing. Let us not compromise our ideas, our utopias, our possessions and rights. Let us give up only the pretension that they are unique and absolute. What could that mean? And so I go on to unpack what that could possibly mean. He says it later on, and this is when he spoke, in, and, he, and, he, and he says it in a... Uh, in the message of Pope Francis for the 48th World Communications Day, I remember reading this to Ralph Martin. You know who Ralph Martin is. I yeah. remember reading this to Ralph Martin, and he said, you're kidding. <laughs> so I said, this is what he said. he said. He said, to dialogue means to believe that the other has something worthwhile to say and to entertain his or her point of view and perspective. Engaging in dialogue does not mean renouncing our own ideas and traditions. You see, this is where people think, oh, well, Francis is saying we, we, you know, we have to affirm our faith and all that. No. But then he says, it means the renouncing of the claim that they alone are valid or absolute. What, what, what could that mean? What does Francis mean when urging us to renounce the claim that the central truth claims of Christianity are alone valid or absolute? And then I get into an analysis of what that could possibly mean. And what implications does it have for you know, the, the absolute significance of the incarnation and the atoning work of Christ. And then I even ask at one point, is this sort of behind the idea where Francis could say, even though he corrected himself on, under pressure from, you know, the Kazakhstan bishops, Bishop Schneider, but it was never corrected formally, you know, that religious diversity is part of the will of God. That's a document. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so it seems to me, it seems to me, this, you would never, ever, ever find this in John Paul II or Benedict. Never, ever, ever. So at a practical level, yeah, I, I don't agree with uh, Assisi uh, insofar as it does create scandal and it did create, uh, I mean, what's his name? Uh, Ratzinger, you, you probably read Truth and Tolerance. He has, he has uh, several pages where he discusses you know, the conditions, multi-religious prayer and inter-religious prayer. And certainly he rejects inter-religious prayer. 
and he and he and he's very skeptical about multi-religious prayer. Mm -hmm. So all of this, you'd never find this in John Paul II. So when when so the so there's yeah the at, at, at the level of practical judgments, prudential judgments, situations like that. I think uh, those are mistaken. Can, can I ask you about that? Because my question pertains then to prudential judgments. You, you're, you're, is it not the case that prudential judgments are reflective of a prior theological and doctrinal position? Therefore, if you have an aberrant prudential decision, it's reflective of an aberrant theological and doctrinal position. Is that not correct? I, I don't think that's the case, because I think in the, in the case of John Paul II, it's reflexive of general revelation. God's revelation of himself in and through the works of creation, that you can find fragments of truth and goodness that God has not left himself without witness. You know, Romans 1, uh, uh, 18 and following. Uh, Roman no, nobody, yeah, but no, nobody's disputing that. But since when have we sat there and um, had, you know, snake handlers and snake worshipers no, come and, and, and worship and, and pray together? I, since when have we done this? They weren't praying together. That's that's not true. Uh, no, no, I mean, no, I understand no, the technicality, but no, honestly, no, I, I don't know if I'm buying that one. It's an important distinction. They I understand the distinction. But. They weren't praying together. It's yeah. an important distinction. And, and again, the point is that one can reject the practice uh -huh. because of the, of, the, uh, of the confusion that it generates in people's minds, you see. Uh, and yet at the same time, I've tried to, you know, in, in many contexts, argue that, uh, you know, John Paul II laid out his theology of uh, where he lays out exactly what was what he, his theology of religion as such, you know. And, he, and also in introducing the... Uh, the whole uh, Assisi meeting, he says very explicitly, this is not, uh, we're not affirming religious relativism, we're not, it's not syncretism, blah, 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 all of that. I think you have to see it in the context of general revelation, and then also the, the, the attempt to take seriously trying to live at peace with all men. Now, it, it, to me, it, it, almost, it honestly seems almost like a cowpow or a distinction without a difference. Because if somebody said, OK, uh, you know, these two individuals, they're not committing adultery. They're just committing, you know, fornicating acts individually. <laughs> they're, they're performing it's unchaste like, acts really individually. Nobody really would buy that. That's a silly comparison. I'm sorry. You're talking. No, they, honestly, they're, they're no. praying together. Yes, they're, no, not, they're praying not praying together. They're not they're praying, not praying in praying unison, together. but no, they're, they're not, praying together. Okay. I'm not going to argue the point. Interreligious prayer, interreligious prayer was not happening then. Oh, it was how? not happening then. They're not because they weren't, in praying, they weren't praying together in unison to. to it has to be in unison. No, no, I'm sorry, it's not true. Well, there was one. You're there was one. Thing. You're making it up. It's not true. It's annoying. So, no, I, I know that it wasn't it in unison. It's not true. It's not true. Oh, what's and, not true? It's not true that they were praying together. There was no interreligious prayer. Let me ask something. Let me ask something about the uh, Assisi event because it's been well documented that they didn't pray together. You know, the, in other words, technic when it came time to pray, to pray, they were given separate quarters and they were given assignments. But here, here's the thing um, that I think they, they were making actual prayers when they were all collectively gathered together, just one at a time. Right. I understand it wasn't in unison, but they're all together, sitting around, huddled around each other, yeah, yeah, making a prayer so one at a time. So this is where Ratzinger says this was a mistake. This yeah. was a mistake because of That's the, because of the occasions. But, but it's a mistake at the level of practical actions. It's not a mistake at the level of their theology, because when you go back and you look at the theology, the theological account, and I've given that many places of uh, John Paul II. When you go back and you look at the theological account that the Pope John Paul II had of a theology of religions, he did not embrace religious pluralism. He's not Francis. I, I understand that. What I'm saying, when they're collectively together, one praying at a time, one at a time, in front of everybody else. Well, that's not even what happened. They went into that, their respect. I can show you videos. The, I, they did go to respect. Well, the I think Michael they also I think, did that yeah. together, but of right. course not in unison. I think Michael's talking. I think Michael's also talking about 
when they opened the prayer day, the, the day. Yeah, I, because I can show you a video of it. So to me, it's a distinction without a difference. Well, no, it's not a distinction in the end without a difference, because if you if you I agree at the level of the practical situation, I'm, I don't support it. But if you put it in the context of the theology of religions that you find in John Paul II, it seems to me that you can you you can't come away thinking that the, that John Paul embraced religious pluralism as if all religions were equally vehicles of salvation, as if they were all praying to the same God. Yeah, I think, that's I the think impression that everybody gets who has not read J JP two. If you just watch this event that's yeah. exactly the impression okay, so you have to then you have to make clear what you know isn't the case you can't you see i try to make clear what isn't the case even while rejecting the practice i try to make clear the theology that informs this and i distinguish it very clearly from the theology of of uh, of francis on this matter because he doesn't he there's nowhere to go where he says uh where he says what John Paul II says. I think, you know, I think that uh, one of the examples that comes up a lot when we talk to folks about this is a statement that St. Thomas Aquinas made uh, where he said, if, if anybody prays before the, uh, Michael, what does it say again? If he prays before the tomb of Muhammad, he- I, I, don't, I don't recall yeah. that. Yeah, if anybody prays in front of the tomb of Muhammad, uh, he, he's, a, he's an apostate, right? right? So, but here's the thing. We we would not say that a blind man who's walking around and, and happens to stumble in front of the tomb of Muhammad and prays is an apostate. So when we, so when they used to say this, that, uh, you know, somebody who prays in front of the tomb of Muhammad is an apostate, they're, they're making implications about the will of the person in front of the tomb, as if the person understands what the tomb signifies and that their prayer is an engagement with the spiritual and the vital significance of Muhammad. But here's the thing, what we see beginning with the ecumenical movement, and this happened in the CC and it happened, it's still happening today, is that we have people gathering in front of the tomb of Muhammad, and then we give this preface, we're not religious indifferentists. Yeah, so that's bullshit, to put it in plain English. Of course that's bullshit. <laughs> this is why I say that even though Francis and others, others, you know, they, uh, they make the distinction between evangelization and interreligious dialogue, and they say, you know, that there's uh, interdependency and blah, 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 that their de facto attitude is one of religious indifferentism because they, because dialogue, interreligious dialogue is not orient, it's not a truth oriented dialogue. It's not a dialogue. They never, they'll, they'll never say, this is why I'm not a Buddhist, a Hindu. You know, I hold these things to be true and so on and so on. So you, at some point, you have to be able to say, you know, um, you have to be able to give a justification for your, for your, the, the beliefs that you hold to be true. And you have to make clear that they're true and that that's why you're a Christian. And of course, of course, this is, this is where we come back to Francis, who, who then says, well, you have to renounce the pretension that your beliefs are, are, are alone, valid and absolute. Well, no wonder he's not no wonder interreligious dialogue doesn't have a truth-oriented dynamic for him. It's not engaged in, uh, you know, epistemic justification and giving reasons for why you hold these things to be true, because he thinks that's all proselytizing, trying to. So, but it seems to me that nothing of you, you don't find any of that. You don't find any of that in John Paul II or in Benedict. And so I think, I think that John Paul the Second, Saint John Paul the Second, is he hopped on board with what a lot of Christians were doing at the time, and and look at the Assisi prayer event. You had conservative Anglicans, you had conservative Greek Orthodox, uh, you had these people who, in their mind, it's kind of impossible, in my opinion, to think that they just threw 
the, the the you know the truth of their religion. To you know, the I wouldn't have gone. Religion. Right. I, I wouldn't have gone. Right. I would have just said, uh, you know, like uh, remember I was telling you before we started today is like Bishop the auxiliary bishop of of Den Bosch. Oh yeah, he didn't want to go to the town. Yeah. He said, "I'm not going to the to the the synod youth, and I'm not going to the Amazonian synod." And and then and he wrote all kinds of critic. I wouldn't have gone, but at the same time, it just seems to me, you you know, I this this is not a consequence. Uh, just to bring it back to that, this is certainly not a consequence of Vatican II. There's nowhere in Vatican II uh, the teachings of Vatican II that uh, in uh, that uh, religious pluralism that all religion. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. I I agree with that a hundred percent. But what that is just uh, oh, but the, but you may agree with it. But but of course. Of course, people draw the conclusion that Assisi is really uh, the fruit of Vatican II, and hence also the church now embraces uh, religious pluralism and so on and so on. It's like people who, when they read uh, Nostra, when they read uh, Lumen Gentium 8, you know, then they turned around and said the church now, I can't tell you how many times or throughout the world where I've spoken, I've had, you know, Push, push back against this ecclesial relativism and ecclesial pluralism. That's what they think. And it, and in fact, before the catechism, the, the universal catechism came out in 92, you know, you had all these, um, these, these uh, catechetical texts, you know, that use oh, yeah. the image of a pie. Right. You right. know, where the Catholic Church may be the largest piece of the pie, and then you have other slices and so on and so on. But it was just a straight... Uh, uh, affirmation that the church now embraced, uh, you know, uh, ecclesial pluralism and multiple. But, you know, but here's the thing, though, because I think reaffirming that we uphold by the code of our doctrine, um, you know, religious absolutism or ecclesial absolutism. Um, the, the, the simple fact of the matter is, like I was saying before we got on the show, I think what's happening is we're trying to square a circle. We're trying to say we are not, we believe in one church, we are not relativists, we are not pluralists, but that's what my right hand says. But I'm going to come and rub elbows and shoulders with other religions. They might pray silently next to me, I'll pray silently next to them in the atmosphere of a mosque. Okay, so I put the question of interreligious relations. Right, right. Question of ecumenical relations are two separate things. But would, but wouldn't my you? Brother say Christ, that? My brother in Christ also prays to the Lord Jesus, so right. that's a different matter. It seems to me. Uh, okay. that's so you're matter. talking about Protestants versus non. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Um, but the, but so let's say that that's valid. We we still do have uh, 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 examples of Catholic bishops and prelates praying with other religions but they don't audibly repeat the same words right you know like Pope the, the, the very that. argument that you used for assisi so what's, what's the difference that and that's the very argument you used for assisi they didn't well, pray in unison well, they're praying I individually you, i already said to you that i uh, regardless of the distinction between interreligious and multi-religious prayer i would never i, I wouldn't have gone to assisi hmm. just as i said i say to my students you know yeah, you know, it's one thing. It's but one. Why thing. not? Why not go to it if there's nothing wrong with it doctrinally? I never said there wasn't anything wrong with it doctrinally. I didn't say there was anything wrong with it. I think. I what th was wrong with the CC doctrinally? I guess is what I'm asking. Okay, uh, as such, nothing. If 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 that means, were they promoting religious? Uh, re were was religious relativism being promoted? No. If you make the distinction between between in you know interreligious prayer and multi-religious prayer they weren't engaged in interreligious prayer but at, but even then even though they weren't engaged in interreligious prayer i think the optics is everything people say the optics are such that they that that if you haven't given an account of this and people haven't read your account they don't really understand your theology of religion remember this is all occurring in a context where people think that the church is changing about everything. And so now they think that, in fact, you can, 
you know, there's no difference between religions and, and all of that kind of stuff. So, so you, in the context, it seems to me, it creates confusion. But I don't think that John Paul II was doctrinally confused or that he actually, uh, uh, you know, affirmed religious pluralism, that he actually thought that all religions were equally vehicles of salvation. All you have to do is read, you know, the, the, the address that he, gave to the, that he gave to the Roman Curia before that happens. And then read also his, you know, the encyclical the Dentoris Missio, where he makes very clear that he rejects religious relativism and all of that. So it seems to me if that's all true, and I, and I, I think it is, then, um, then you have to make that clear. I think that's what we have to, we have to, we, we have to make that clear to people. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to make it clear yeah. to people. Would you, would uh, Dr. Echeverria, uh, would you say that this is a comparable analogy? Um, because essentially what we're getting at here is we're trying to say that you can have a, a bad prudential decision that stands on top of the foundation of a true valid doctrine. So, for example, um, when, when St. Paul said that uh, when Gentiles sacrifice uh, animals to the gods. Um, there are no gods. So there are the, no gods. The, the real doctrine, the, the true doctrine is that not, there were no offerings to any real gods out there. That's right. Here but, in Israel. But, but, but Paul said, if you take that true doctrine, you can go around destroying your brothers with it. Oh, that's right. So then the question becomes, if this is a stumbling block for your brother, he says, then you mustn't do it. Right. And I would say that that's what I, I, would, I think that's what you're trying to say is that, you know, John Paul, um, Benedict the 16th come out and they say, you know, all of the, the unicity of Christianity, the absoluteness of Christianity, all those things we put, we, we nail it down 25 feet under the ground. That's not going anywhere, no. but we're going to have, uh, Patriarch Athenagoras over, and he's going to kiss the tomb. The, some of these things are prudential decisions that really do conflict, um, but not essentially. Well, but that we're talking. Yeah, that's an example of or orthodoxy, isn't it? So that's in that's in the context of you know fellow Christians. Yeah, it, but, but I, I, it, uh, like. Yeah. Like, I don't understand how he gets Francis gets together with this imam, this grand imam. Well, that's, that's, yeah, that's that, that, that's, that's, that's that, to me that's beyond the pale. Right, but that's I always say, speaking from a 16th century point of view, yeah. having the patriarch of Constantinople uh, two feet side by side with you, kissing the the um, the the, the as kissing the, the ground at the holy sepulcher of our Lord. From a 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century point of view, that right there to them would would equate to religious. Now we've we there's been development in our understanding of these things. Right, right. But, and not, but there's been development without change. There's no change in the church's fundamental ecclesiology, even though there's development. The development is homogeneous. It's organic in that sense. The, you know, this is all part of, uh, unless we think we have to go back to the 16th century, we have to be, you know, it's like the, it's like the neo-traditionalist who thinks that we have to go, we can we, we have to affirm, you know, mortalium animus, that that's the, the church's position on ecumenism, or that we have to go back to Gregory the 16th, Mirari Vos, that that's the church's position on religious liberty, or, or, or later on in the 19th century as well, Leo. I, th I think we have to be able to account for a turnabout in understanding of things, so a reversal, without claiming that there's a change in the fundamental teachings of the church. There is no fun. Ecumenism does not change the fundamental ecclesiology of the church. It can I ask you? Can I ask you a question? You you mentioned that you don't know how Pope Francis could pray with a muslim imam and you've also mentioned does earlier pray? does he pray I, I does he pray with the imam i don't know 
well, you know, he prayed next to him. So, <laughs> but anyways, um, you you said you don't know how he gets together with him. Well, here here's my question. You said that this doesn't go back to Vatican II, but we do see with Vatican II, and we do see with the Catechism that the Muslims together with us worship the one true God. So is it not the case that perhaps that's where Pope Francis is coming no, from? He thinks, so, well, he, we worship the same true God so we can get together I, I, and do these things. I agree, but that seems to me, I've written about this as well, and, and many others have written about this. Uh, it seems to me you have to say two things here. Of course, uh, you know, Muslims are monotheists like, like we are. They're monotheists. They happen to be Unitarians, of course, and we're Trinitarians, but they're monotheists, and they have a theology of creation that excludes uh, naturalism, that excludes the idea that we're just a chance product of matter in motion and all that. So those things, it seems to me, we can say, wow, those things they affirm, we share with them those truths. Furthermore, okay, if we go on to examine their understanding of the one God, they, they ascribe, they, they predicate of unicity of the one of God, huh? so that there's only one God. But when we begin to analyze what they mean by unicity, by oneness, you see, their God exists alone. He's solitary. So even with respect to the question of oneness, of unicity, we, there's a difference because what we predicate if you probe more deeply, we don't share the understanding of unicity because in, in we're Trinitarians. And so there's unity and diversity in the Godhead, a, a, a unity at the level of uh, relationship, a, a unity at the level of, uh, of being, a unity at the level of knowledge and all of that. So, so on the one hand, I think we, I, I, I would try to honor what uh, Vatican II says. And I think it's not difficult to honor that by virtue of their their monotheists they have a theology of creation um i, I understand I, that look I, I i get that they're not animists i, I understand they're monotheists well, the problem right. is yeah. it, it's not hitting the target it you know their their bow and arrow it's facing the target it's in the right direction but the arrow never hits the mark and that's the problem that. i agree with that so so even the uh uh, uh, Father uh, Kamil Sah Sahir, who's a, is a Jesuit Islamologist, when he criticized Pope Francis uh, in uh, Evangelii Gaudium, where the popes made these comments about uh, basically just repeating without commentary, you know, what, uh, what both uh, uh, Lumen Gentium says and then also Nostra Aetate, and uh, and uh, Father Samir, uh, Samir said, "Yes, in one sense, of course, this is true. They're, you know, they're they're monotheist and theology of creation and so on and so on. But of course, in another sense, of course, it's not true. Just as I said a moment ago, it's not true that we share, even though we both predicate oneness of God, that there's only one God. Their understanding of oneness is such that God exists in isolation." The Catechism says in the section on the Trinity that God does not exist in isolation. He does not exist in, in, in solitude. It's a, it, there's unity and diversity within the Godhead. So when you begin to unpack these things, of course, you can see that, that, that in fact, even those things that we seem to commonly predicate of the Godhead, there are going to be fundamental differences. And of course, the Trinity, the Christology, uh, you know, the Nicene Creed, we can't somehow think that that's just uh, unimportant or just simply, um, you know, not necessary to understand who God is. So, so I would say there too, I, I, I don't, I would never pray with a Muslim. You know, when I see, when I see, the, when I see the Archbishop, you know, hanging out, Archbishop Ignorant, hanging out uh, at some kind of ecumenical gathering. Archbishop Ignorant? <laughs> No, Archbishop Vigneron. Oh, okay. I thought you said Archbishop. Uh, Ignorant. Are you talking about? Uh, are you talking about Vigneron? Yeah, Archbishop of uh, Detroit. Oh, oh. Okay. Archbishop of okay. Detroit. Archbishop okay. Vigneron. Gotcha. Alan Vigneron. So when he, when if I see him hanging around or at some kind of, some kind of interreligious gathering, it's one thing to have, you know, to have dinner and 
you know, have fellowship and, and uh, fellowship at the level of ordinary human uh, relationships and so on and so on. But I don't think that that's, uh, I mean, to me, that's not, uh, that, that's not really uh, interreligious dialogue. Um, um, and as I said, I think dialogue in the end has to be truth oriented. That's how, that's how John Paul II uh, understood it. That's how Benedict understood it. Francis never raises the question of truth. He never raises. It. Ratzinger says at one point those two principles that I that I uh, uh, enum uh, you know described earlier about uh, you know you can learn from from the other from the otherness of the other in his thinking and uh, and that uh, and that you you bring you know you bring to the conversation the full range of Christian commitments. That's all fine. But it seems to me that uh, Ratzinger says that's just superficial in the end. That's just superficial. Those were his words. That's just superficial because at some point you have to give a, 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 a you have to give an account. You have to give a, a, a justification of those beliefs that you hold to be true, uh, uh, absolutely true. So Francis wants us to renounce that. We have to renounce that that are that are Christian beliefs are uh, alone valid and absolute well so it seems to me that uh, i'm not surprised that uh, he doesn't seem to have a problem getting you know meeting with uh, even though meeting with this grand this grand imam even though as uh, as william kilpatrick said in a recent article in in i think it was either crisis or it was the catholic thing where he says you know that this imam is an anti-semite yeah, he himself is not on board with any of that. Yeah. No, no. So I don't. Yeah, exactly. So I don't understand. So all of that it just seems to me is is confusion. You know, I say I said in a, I said in one place where, uh, you know, where Francis had this, uh, this kind of uh, it reminded me of the, you know, the um, that uh, the bumper sticker, you know, of all these religions, so where he has this video this was the first video he did of oh you're talking about yeah where where they had the, they're all going they had around. The buddha, the, yeah the buddha doll oh yeah yeah please yeah. this is i mean i had an I, any uh, evangelical protestant friend of mine he emailed me and said ed what what what's going on here what is he kidding by, by the way that coexist sticker that we always see yeah, I want you to know it's intolerant because if you notice, there's only two genders listed on there. Oh yeah, <laughs> it doesn't recognize the fluidity no, no, of gender no, theory still, and all that. So. Still stuck in binary stuff. No, yeah, right, but, right. I, 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 let me let me let me just summarize my point here. My point is, if you're asking me if doctrine changes, I don't think doctrine changes at the fundamental level of uh, dog. Remember, not all dogmas are doctrines, so dogmas pertain to first level, primary object of infallibility. Uh, um, um, a secondary object of infallibility is a doctrine, but it's not a dogma. And there are all kinds of different reasons that are given for that. Uh, but it's not going to change. There is, when I, I tell people, I've told people in different contexts when I've talked about this, I, you know, I take the example of marriage and what marriage is. Uh, it's about, and it's, it's Jesus himself referring us to, to, in Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, referring us to Genesis 127 and Genesis 224. Marriage is about permanence. It's about two-ness, male and female two-ness. And hence, it's about sexual differentiation being a fundamental prerequisite for the two to become one flesh. There will never be a time when the church affirms same-sex marriage. What these the, the, the German episcopacy is doing, it seems to me, is utterly wrong. They appeal to Amor Satizia, by the it, way. There's for, nothing for, in Amor Satizia, uh, and I've written it critically about Amor Satizia. Well, here, here's the thing. I mean, Amor Satizia kind of makes room for mitigating circumstances that reduces a grave sin down to venial sin. So can you not at least perhaps say that some homosexual acts could be reduced uh, from a grave sin right. to a venial no, sin? No, no. Now, that's I know that's not what the bishops are saying, because the bishops are saying... Uh, I'm, they're, they're, that's not what the German Episcopacy is arguing, and that's not even. Yeah, they're they're saying it's not sinful at all. They're saying it's not sinful at all. They're affirming, yeah. you know, homosexual identity is creational. Well, Francis doesn't say that. In my view, 
uh, the logic of the moral logic of pastoral reasoning in chapter in uh, chapter eight of Amoris Laetitia, I think, collides with the teachings of the church as Francis lays them out. Uh, there's nothing in Amoris Laetitia that actually, as such, rejects the teaching of the church on marriage. Huh? Uh, I, I, there's so much documentation yeah. there. That, yeah, that, yeah, it's yeah that, not the case. Yeah. But it's the logic, it's the moral logic of pastoral reasoning that that I think collides with uh, with the teaching. And then you have these people that that he surrounds himself with that have tried to exploit that teaching and expand it beyond the boundaries of the question of divorce and civilly remarried, which I, which I, I reject. Uh, and then they expand it to cohabiting couples, whether you're uh, hetero, homosexual, and so on. And so, of course, um, um, you know, the fact that Francis never never actually definitively made clear what his teach what what does Amor Sotitia teach um, you know creates this kind of uh, context in which you have these crazies who wanted to who for years have have wanted to change they, for years they've rejected the church's teaching on sexual morality uh, I've written about this as well you know the the Belgian bishops of of uh, of, uh, of uh, Bishop Johann Bonny of Antwerp you know, he co-wrote a book with uh, uh, a moral theologian from the Catholic University of, of Louvain, and and they rejected the they rejected the, the the catechism of the Catholic Church. It's it's teaching on the sixth commandment. So they rejected the Christian anthropology of Genesis one twenty seven, uh, and and they go on to reject all the offenses against chastity and blah blah blah. All of that is the case. Yeah, yeah. That, that's substantial and fundamental change in doctrine. That is, you see, that's not development. And anybody that tells you, including, including, uh, you know, Cardinal Marx, who tells you, or even I remember Cardinal, uh, what's his name, out of out of Stupid. Stupid. Schomber, of Supich, please. Cardinal. You talking about Schoenborn? Yeah, Schoenborn. You know that this is just development and so on and so on. It's not development. It's change. Remember, uh, uh, Vincent de Lorraine says there's a difference between progress and change, between development and change. Change is when one thing becomes something else. Uh, development. Corruption. Sorry? Yeah, Newman, Newman calls that corruption specifically. Yeah, that's corruption, exactly. So they, what the German Episcopal is doing is corrupting, corrupting the teachings of the church. Mm -hmm. and, um, and even though Francis, to give him credit, Francis wrote this long letter. I don't know why it was so long, but if you read the letter, you know he was trying to say to them that synodality is not is not uh, such that you know that an that an episcopal conference could can teach something that is binding on the whole church. We're Catholic, he said. There has to be the you, you know there's unity here. He also told them not to not to uh, uh, accommodate themselves to the culture and so on and so on. And then even and even then the Apostolic Nuncio of Germany told them that they had to heed Francis and and so on and so on. Uh, but they don't pay attention. I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't know what's going to happen here. But I, as I said to someone the other day, the fact that the German bishops are doing this has nothing to do with Vatican II. It has to do with Francis. They feel emboldened by Francis to do whatever they want. Because they, now, yeah, I would say that Vatican II allowed for an environment where you could have a Francis. No, I, 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 I think it did. I, I, think, I think it let go of the reins. No, I, I really did. No, I don't think so. If if that were the case, then during during the tenure of uh, John Paul II, when when uh, when Ratzinger was uh, was prefect for the CDF, we wouldn't have had. You know this repeated discipline of all these theologians, whether it was uh, Hans Kung, Charles Curran, uh, what's her name, uh, Sister Margaret Farley, uh, blah blah blah, the, the, and the, the constant. Uh, uh, the but it, what I'm saying is, it weakened the structure of the church by letting go of the reins, and over time, it develops into what we currently have with Pope Francis. So it enabled that environment, maybe not directly, but indirectly. No, I don't agree with that. I don't think there's anything in the Vatican II document that can lead you to 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 what the German. Yeah, I think I think what Michael I think what Michael's saying is there's no prescription uh, uh, of saying this. But for example, if you have a law that says 
humans can't swim with crocodiles. And then all of a sudden, 10 years later, you say, well, on certain conditions, you can swim with crocodiles. Eventually, that's going to lead to an environment where people are going to start crawling yeah. around the law. You know what? In John Paul II, in Veritatis Splendor, just to take that, it's there are moral absolutes. It's very oh, yeah. clear. Oh, yeah, so yeah, the yeah. idea that he, the, the idea that there's no way that uh, that the you know, look, the Pope John Paul II and Benedict were trying to turn the ship around during the 35 years of their tenure as 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 popes. They were trying to turn the ship around because, in fact, the you know the 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 the, the Vatican II documents, not the literal sense of the documents. But people, this is why in 1985, John Paul II called a synod on the whole question regarding the reception of Vatican II. And it laid out, the synod lays out certain principles for reading Vatican II documents. And one of those principles has to do that we can't pit the spirit of the council right. over against the letter of the text. So the literal sense of the text, the literal sense of the text. So you had people. I, I get that, and and I would say the literal sense, even itself, just weakened things. It may not have prescribed error, no, but no. it weakened things no, by what agree. it did not say. No, I don't agree. I don't agree because just as I said earlier, the council, for instance, regarding the question of ecumenism, it doesn't work it out for you. There is a surface contradiction between mortalium animus. And the decree and ecumenism. And that's a weakening. Work, work it out for you, that surface contradiction. Just as there's a surface contradiction between, you know, Mirari Vos of Gregory the Sixteenth and uh, Leo the Thirteenth's encyclicals that rejected religious liberty, the Declaration on Religious Liberty, Dec Dignitas Humani, doesn't work out that surface contradiction. It simply assumes that th that there's no real contradiction. So it it leaves it up to the faithful theologians of the church and others and, to work and that's it out. the problem and it should not have it should no, have been but explicit not, those documents were not academic documents those i understand that but they were there to reform the church it, michael because the charges that you make it seems to me you're pushing the documents in a in as if the documents themselves are 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 were written in a kind of an accommodating way no it seems to me there's they, no question there's no question that there's a surface contradiction. And we we, we know the conditions in which it was written. The Rhine flows into the Tiber. You uh, you know the history oh, of yeah, this. That's jargon. That's jargon, Michael. You you would say that's jar jargon. I think it's jargon. I think it's jargon. So you reject yeah. that that's the environment, that I, the actual I, I documentation that the novel, he the gives you. The Nouvelle Théologie of de Lubeck and Congar and Donnelou. Uh, no, no, no. They, he, he gives you behind-the-scenes history of what's going on while they're discussing these documents. You're saying that's inaccurate? Well, what I'm saying is that the final documents do not reflect, do not reflect what later and almost immediately after the council, people that were calling for a, you know, for a Vatican III and so on. I, un I understand that, but what I'm saying is they did not take enough precaution and measures to guard against those things because it left things out that it should have said. It's not so much what it did say as much as what it did not say. Well, it, did not, tell us, it did not tell us, you know, the, as again, I, my examples, there's a surface contradiction between mortalium animus and uh, the decree in ecumenism. It doesn't work that out for us. But but it seems to me that if you go back and you read that you read those documents in their historical in their historical you read mortalium animus as i said in its historical context everything that was rejected by uh, pius the 11th is rejected by is rejected by, uh, by, uh, by vatican II. Right. and so it seems to me there you have john paul ii benedict the 16th ratzinger you know, during his tenure as prefect, and they're trying to turn the ship around in 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 in, the, in his encyclicals. There's no way that you can get from Veritatis Splendor even to chapter eight of Amoris Laetitia. No way. Why? There's no way. That's why Francis never cites in the 330 footnote 
of a more sophisticated. He never cites a very type of splendor. That's why the 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 dubia the dubia cardinals asked the Sarah's second question had to do with the question of moral absolutes. I don't think the Pope affirms moral absolutes. Right. He preserve he he affirms precepts that have presumptive validity, but that's different from negative moral precepts that are you know always and everywhere uh, wrong. So my point is you there's no way to get from there's no way to get from Vatican II documents to um, to um, uh, Amoris Laetitia. There's not no legitimately. To... Yeah, I would agree. Not I mean, legitimately. I don't, I don't care about yeah. illegitimately. I care about. Legit I do. I care. I no. want a council that will actually guard against these problems you you and, and not just legitimately. So if you can't yes. legitimately, yes. the people because are doing here's the thing. Here's the thing. I can teach something that is 100% correct, but in such a way that does not guard against oh, what well, I know everybody is going to Michael, interpret it. Michael, I can do that. Michael, and that, that is not sufficient. Michael, you're wrong. There's Just no saying I'm wrong doesn't make you wrong. <laughs> no, no, you are wrong. I've written about it. Read what I've written. There's okay. no way to get from a more there's no way to get from Vatican II to a more Satizia. Okay. Just as there's no way to get, I've written about this. I because but in, in that's our, not what I was saying though. I, well, I wasn't saying you, you go from Vatican II to more. How do you get? But then no legitimate way. But what what I'm saying is, even though you cannot go to the text of Vatican II and say, okay, here's where that error came from. What I'm saying is, it did not sufficiently guard against those aberrant interpretations. You have to tell me exactly where you think that that's the case. Because yeah. I don't see it. Okay. Yeah. I don't sure. see it. Where where is that the case? Where did it not sufficiently guard itself from? Uh on religious liberty, for instance, um, on ecumenism, of course, on um Lumen Gentium in no, the I, church. No, that, I, I, I don't think it sufficiently guarded. I don't think that there's any errors in it. But what? I think when you start talking about those who do not have a direct knowledge of God, um, so they've not come to an explicit knowledge of God, even those people are not beyond God's uh, salvific graces. I mean, technically that's true, but if you don't put enough qualifiers there, you're not sufficiently guarding the deposit of faith, and it might lend to that, even though you you. You know, there's no technically, and there's no error there in Lumen Gentium. But there's no legitimate way. No, I, I, that's what I said. I, I said illegitimate, no but I can know. Not doing it prop or not? But I can, but I can know if people are going to misinterpret my words and illegitimately interpret me. And if I don't sufficiently guard against that, that's yeah. on me, not on them. Just well, how? That, okay, I mean, this is a. I, I, I don't. I don't want to go on with this because I just think you're absolutely wrong about this. That's fine. Uh, and uh, and I don't see you. You're just talking in generalities. I don't see how those. I gave I gave you an example on individuals who have not come to a conscious knowledge of God, for instance. Well, but the, that's distinction, okay. the distinction is has to do with the invincible ignorance. Yeah, sure. You reject yeah. that distinction. No, I don't reject that distinction. Okay, so then, so then that th what I got done saying several times now is that text itself is not wrong. That is true, but in the environment in which it's written, you know people are not going to be making the necessary distinctions that they should make, that even the text itself so does then, not always explicitly the make. Responsibility, the responsibility is on the church's teachers, on the priests. And the council. And well, the, the council. council did what it did, and it stated what it stated. And, and it should no have stated more, is what yeah, I'm saying. But it wasn't an academic treatise. This is like... Uh, I, it doesn't matter. Like, uh, e even though it was suggested by Archbishop Lefebvre that there would be an academic list of documents and then a non-academic list of documents, the council well, rejected that. This reminds that. me of a discussion. I, I, I won't say who was involved in the discussion, but a discussion we had at uh, uh, evangelicals and Catholics together when we were working on the document that came out a few years ago on, uh, on marriage. Uh, the two shall become one flesh, and one of the participants in that uh, in that conversation, he wanted us to address every conceivable, uh, you know, academic objection to how you know the. Spirit I'm not asking the Vatican to right. address every conceivable right. objection. Only those that, that the council knew 
that the people would have interpreted as. I mean, it knew how things were in were, was in the '60s. It knew what the issues were of of the day. It knew what um, the council knew what it could have guarded against. So that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying as the you know, discuss every conceivable well, objection, just the ones of the day that are vulnerable to misinterpretation. Well, that, the ones of the day, it seems to me nobody, nobody at that time was discussing questions about religious pluralism, just like nobody at that time was discussing questions about marriage, you know, same-sex marriage or anything of that sort. Anyway, the point is that uh, it seems to me that uh, there's no legitimate, there's no legitimate way to get from from Vatican II documents, uh, it, it just as I, I'm, you know, reading, uh, you know, some neo-traditionalists, you know, they they think that, you know, Vatican II opened the door to, uh, you know, to relativism about uh, a relativist view of truth. I, I, I just think that's just it's just nonsense. I'm sorry, it's just nonsense. So we have a there's no way to get from Vatican II documents to a more. Yeah, I, I let me say some. Let me say some. I, I don't think anybody here is saying that you can get. Uh, uh, you, there's a legitimate line from Vatican II to uh, what we're talking about here, but what I think, it, just the fact that there was all these post-Vatican II clarification documents. But you know why that would. Do you know why that was, uh, uh, Eric? Precisely the, for the reason that Ratzinger gave, and that is, and and the reason why later on in '85 the Synod came out with those six principles, because people were saying that the spirit of Vatican II was inadequately realized in those documents, and so now we needed to get to a Vatican III to give a more adequate formulation of what was what what in their minds had been anticipated in those. Right. Documents. Yeah. They, that of course they, relativized the, the 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 text the text of Vatican II. But right. Yeah, 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 they, yeah. They, they they didn't see the Vatican II documents giving enough ammunition to to what they were wanted to you know they so saw the, it as like they, were inadequate formulations of the spirit of Vatican II, right. whatever that was. Right, right. Yeah. So, but you know, take a text like uh, the CDF had a, you know co like a document was called the Common Misunderstandings about Communion. Um, you had Dominus Iesus, right? Right. Um, you had these te these texts that were written because of so many dubia being sent to the Holy See. Oh, yeah. The misunderstandings the way of, that those texts were being appropriated. Yeah, it's no different than you could say the Council of Nicaea. You know, you fifty years after Nicaea, or I want to say a hundred years after Nicaea. You had the Nestorians saying that they were the true Nicenes, and you had mm -hmm. you had uh, you know the the um, Theodore of Mopsuestia and 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 Nestorius and Theodore of Cyrus, they were saying no, they're holding to Nicaea, whereas um, Cyril of Alexandria, Flavian of Constantinople, they were holding to you know they were not Nicenes, and it was going back and forth. Um, and it took, you know, it took Leo's tome, it took Chalcedon, it took well, Chalcedon. Sure. So, so no one can claim, I don't claim that, uh, just as I don't claim that Trent was, these are perfect documents. Uh, of course, you can't claim that uh, that the Vatican II documents said everything that needs to be said. No, but what it said, it seems to me, was true. And, uh, and like, for instance, um, there's no there's no basis in in Vatican II documents to conclude to religious pluralism. I mean, even Gaudium et Spes, which often gets bad press, Gaudium et Spes 22 says that it's only in the mystery of the word made flesh that the mystery of man takes on light. Huh? So it, so the incarnation is central to self human self understanding and and all of that. Huh? So it seems to me that don't so you have the appropriation of of Vatican II documents, people wanting to, you know, to, to turn around and and say, you know, religious pluralism and and that all religions are equally vehicles of salvation and and all other kinds of technical theological uh, distinctions between between the Spirit and the Word and 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 so on, or even distinctions within the Trinity itself. And so there's there's uh, Dominus Jesus, the Lord Jesus, on the salvific. Uh, universe, unis, on the unicity 
There's only one savior on the unicity and salvific universality of Christ and the church. So it seems to me the church is also a listening church. We can't think that, you know, it's a teaching church. Uh, the mistake now that we have is that it's, you know, it's just like the uh, the newly appointed um, the newly appointed uh, uh, a prefect for uh, evangelization of all people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, Tagli, uh, and he says we have to be a listening church and blah blah blah. No, yes, of course the church is a listening church because you know when you know uh, there are t there there are things happening now questions being raised and we have to attend to those questions but the church is also at the same time a teaching church so the two are there's a mutual there's an interdependency between the two and so it seems to me unless we're going to think that uh, everything that needed to be said should could have been said should have been said by vatican II, which was uh, you know more than 50 years ago there are things that weren't said Right. And, and that, but that's my that's my concern. Not not that there's anything in the text itself, um, but that it did not sufficiently address certain things to protect the faith adequately in the current environment in which it was in. Even though the words themselves they're not wrong, it's just they're but not I, sufficiently guarding what against. What I problems. would say to that is, as I've said already, what I would say is that uh, is that. Uh, the, the context in which the texts were written uh, uh, did not at that time need to address all these issues. I, I think it absolutely did. I mean, first of all, we came out of modernism at the turn of the 20th century. You got the hippie era going on in, in the 60s. You have all kinds of issues even prior to Vatican II. Um, under the pontificates of uh, Pope Pius the Twelfth, you you have a weakening of the reins there, and so I think you I did have by the weakening of yeah. the reins. Well, the service of errors was no longer required. You you have well, quite well, a no longer required. The syllabus of errors that was okay. So, but that doesn't mean that there weren't. Yes, of course. So the syllabus of errors that doesn't mean that they that uh, look. I, 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 I brought this up. In, no, in, no, in Vatican II oh, didn't deny anything. John, John, the opening speech of John the Twenty Third at uh, at Vatican II, Gaudé Mater Ecclesia, in the, in paragraph eleven, the section, the Council's principal task, defending and promoting doctrine. The greatest concern of the Ecumenic Council is this: that the sacred deposit of Christian doctrine should be should be more effectively defended and presented. And then he goes yeah. on, and that's the context in which. Now, of course, the, the plenty. Of, that's the context in which the the quote from Vincent of Loren takes place, and the distinction between truth and its formulations, and according to the same meaning and the same judgment. All yeah. of those things, of course, of course. You but know, you would say Vatican II was written in a context that was healthy, ecclesially and theologically. I would. Yes, I think so. Okay. I think it came. I, that, I, that we could do a whole show on that one. I think I could present the opposite I think, thesis. I think the Vatican II documents, as they stand, I think they're beautiful. They're true. No, I'm and, saying the environment in which it was in that that current time in which the documents were written. Environment that I part of the environment that I think was important was the the influence of the Novel Theologie of the Lubeck and Congar and Danilou. I don't I don't see them. They're not modernist in my view. Modernism. I, I brought a, a quote from uh, from Aidan Nichols. Um, uh, they're not they're, these guys, the, the, the Lubeck and Congar. They're not modernists. The, uh, uh, Nichols. Aidan Nichols says in his book Catholic Thought Since the Enlightenment. He says on dogma, the modernists gave the impression that doctrine was simply a vehicle for the response of a given age to the divine. Well, let let me finish. A doctrine well suited to the to the zeitgeist of one generation might be gawkily out of place in another. Instead of saying that there is a historical dimension to the explicitation of doctrine, there is a historical dimension to the to the making explicit of doctrine. Uh, evolution becomes everything, and so these what we have now the modernists were historicists they denied the enduring validity of truth they were experiential expressivists they had a liberal view of, of revelation revelation they didn't believe in revealed truth 
Yeah, uh, it's the, none of the players my, at Vatican II are my, classical my, modern. My thing is, I'm talking about the context and the environment. If you read Garrick Rue Lagrange's article, "Where Is the Nouvelle Theologie Taking Us?" He, he gives you the Nouvelle Theologie. He I gives you explicit the theologians and their quotes and their errors no, and he problems. He does address them and gives you problems with them. Now, I would say. Perhaps are are you going to just take issue with Gary Gru Lagrange and say, all right, I these individuals he's quoting, he doesn't Burkhauer. understand them. In my book on Burkhauer, I take issue with uh, with that essay by Gary. So so when one of the individuals in that document that he cites saying says that theology evolves and ah, changes, no, the no, doctrine no, he's evolves. He's citing. You don't have a problem with that. Well, I think I think because he's quoting individuals who say no, he's doctrine and person. dogma. Changes. No, he's, you, you know, he's quoting one person. He's quoting right, one but the, but he that, wasn't alone. There were there were other individuals who held this view, and there's no, multiple no, people no, that he quotes. Yes, you can understand what uh, uh, what uh, the the theologian that he's quoting. I think it's been misappropriated. I think it could be seen as as his somehow saying that theology has to adapt with the times. Mm -hmm. And so on. So you could read him as a modernist if we if we take the uh, the quote that I just gave you from uh, uh, from Ada Nichols about modernism. Yeah, you could read you could read him that way. Uh, but but I don't think if you read the work, uh, my my colleague, my friend, uh, uh, Father Monsignor Guarino wrote his doctoral dissertation on this and on this particular thinker whose name whose whole name escapes me at the moment. Um, but I don't think that uh, that that these guys are modernists. I don't think the Nouvelle Théologie is modernist. So I know uh, Gadigal Lagrange, but I think uh, you can have all kinds of conversations about Gadigal Lagrange. But I don't think that uh, if you read, uh, you know, if you read uh, 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 Congar's The History of, of, of Theology, if you read, uh, if, even if you read, for instance, uh, Donna Lou's book on uh, on, on uh, religious epistemology, I, I just think it's it's so easy to sort of lump all these guys, uh, even Roberto Mattei, the Italian Catholic historian, you know, he runs the two together. He thinks that, uh, and also, what's his name also, Peter Kauziski, you know, they run together, you know, the Novel Theologie and modernism. I, I, I would, I, I just, I think that that's just not true. And I think it's defensively, uh, it's, it's, it's just not true. Uh, that's that's another another conversation to have, but I think it's just not true. Uh, but yeah, we should have a we should have a discussion. I, I think we should. We we need a part three to do uh, this <laughs> because I, I take the position that guys like Congar Dunlu and uh, these guys were not classical modernists, you know. But but I think there's another there's a there's a brand new fish of of problem that that arises that uh, it's indirect. But again, we'd have to have a whole yeah, show. That, that, that's a whole hour there. Let me do so just me, a couple me, um, qu uh, questions here. A passage uh, quickly from, uh, um, you know, from uh, <coughs> uh, from from Aidan Nichols leading on into uh, uh, to Congar. Uh, uh, Aidan Nichols says, though modernism had been a false answer, it had set a real question, and the, the real question was, what's the relationship between truth? and its formulations between dogma and history. What is the real question it raised, I asked. Congar replies, modernism raised the problem, and I'm quoting him here, of the variations in the representations and the intellectual construction of the affirmations of faith. The novel theologians solved the problem by distinguishing between an invariant of affirmations, this is this is Congar, and the variable usage of technical notions to translate essential truths in historical context, differing culturally and philosophically, and then Cong and then uh, Congar says, for them, for the for the Nouvelle Théologie, the invariant was a set of affirmations have a real content of truth, and secondly, in the differing notional translations which the theologians had given, there existed an analogy of relations or a functional equivalence between the notions used to express that truth. That's the whole point of Vincent Overends, that it has to be according to the same meaning and the same judgment of truth. So the alternative formulation has to mediate the same meaning and the same judgment of truth. It can't be something else. You can say the same thing differently. It can't, 
Yes, of course, sometimes people are going to say something different. But in this way, he says, they escape the accusation of ruinous anti-intellectualism and dogmatic relativism justly brought against the modernist. So at the very least, you have to say that that Congar and the Lubach and even and, and certainly uh, Balthazar and so on, they did not regard themselves as modernists, even right. though they thought that the modernists raised a question that needed to be addressed. Yeah, those individuals were not classic modernists. I, I don't unlike yeah. they're not modernists in any sense because the modernist denies the enduring validity of truth. He, as uh, as as uh, Nichols says, uh, evolution is everything, and and so they're experiential expressivists. They have a, a you know liberalism has an experientialist view of God. You see and. Uh, and then subsequent to that experience, you use words and sentences and doctrines, uh, but there's no truth that is itself revealed. Huh? There's no truth that is itself, there's no truth that is itself revealed. There's just a reflection on the experience. Right. right. And so, yeah. so this that's modernism. Right. What the German bishops, Stop what the German bishops are doing is in fact classical modernism huh? right that that's a toll that's yeah that's a whole nother animal i i think that we could all agree on that yeah sure Let, let's go to just a couple questions here and we got to wrap it up um so what what is your opinion on pope francis and his recent statement on mary as co-redemptrix or as i, I don't really i don't want to get into the discussion of that now that's okay. an old that's a whole other kettle of fish as uh as uh, eric has said that's a whole other kettle of fish Okay. Uh, what about this one? A hypothetical question. If Francis is in heresy, then based on Sadis Cognitum, does God recognize him as presently holding the papal office or not? Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm afraid I don't know off the top of my head what, uh, what Leo said in paragraphs 18 and 19, so we'd have to discuss that. Mm -hmm. what, is he, what, did par, what does Leo say in paragraphs 18 and 19? Well, with, with, without, any, without any elaboration, the idea is that somebody who is a heretic um, doesn't have membership in the church. You know? Yeah, but what exactly is, uh, is uh, what, why does he think that, what does he think Francis is saying that contradicts? Uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a sticky question. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. lot, lots involved there. <laughs> I, think, um, I think it's a, okay, here's another yeah, if Pope Francis endorses prayers to Pachamama, does it that mean he's in communion with Pachamama and therefore everyone else? So we are technically in communion with the pagan demonic well, deity. Again, is that that really? is a whole complicated conversation. Although my own view is that in itself, in itself, that image is uh, idolatrous. The Church has, throughout the ages, engaged in. Um, um, engaged in the recognition that there are elements of, of truth, general revelation, God has not left himself without witness, and so that those elements of truth and goodness can be transposed. And in the process of being transposed in the Christian context, Newman says they're clarified, of course, they're transmuted, they're changed. Huh? So the, 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 the spoils of the Egyptians, as uh, uh, the, the spoils of the Egyptian trope as Augustine called it. That's something that's uh, that the church has engaged in throughout the ages. So unless we're going to deny general revelation, uh, remember St. Romans 1, Acts 17, St. Paul cites, uh, you know, cites uh, um, uh, uh, pagan, pagan authors. Uh, but in itself, of course, I think Pach Pachamama is an idol, is idolatrous, okay? Um, you know, obviously the Pope doesn't think so. I think uh, the the whole place of that uh, image has been confusing from the outset. Nobody clarified it. You had questions about it and so on and so on. I wrote about this as well because uh, uh, Andre Tornelli, the uh, the editor of, uh, of Vatican News, was, you know, cited uh, Newman at one point, and I said, well, this is nonsense. This is... This is, uh, you know, from chapter six of uh, uh, development of Christian doctrine on the assimilative power of truth, Newman says. But of course, Newman doesn't think that in itself, you can just take that in itself, because in itself, of course, it's going to be an idol. It has, yeah, right. it has to be transmuted, transformed, he says, 
in in light of the Christian revelation and and so on and so on. So, you know, motherhood. Uh, yeah, there may be all kinds of goods there, but they have to be put in a proper Christian context. You can't just leave it there. You can't treat them as, in other words, I say, you can't treat them as neutral goods, because once you put them back into the 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 the, the, the nature religions of uh, the Amazonian uh, culture, it's. Um, it's obvious that they don't comport with the, you know, the full revelation of God in Christ and all of that. So, okay, but, one one last one, uh, then we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Do you believe Pope Francis is in contradiction with the previous teachings of the Church on the death penalty? Well, again, here too, it has. To, they're just they're just a dispute about what the status of the death penalty is. You know, uh, my colleague uh, Bob Fastigi doesn't think that it's infallible teaching, and so he thinks that there can be uh, you know, a change there, um, um, you know, whereas uh, Edward Feeser and others think it is infallible teaching, and so, and so the, it can't change, you see. So the whole conversation, uh, that's part of the conversation. The other part of the conversation is that even though, even if, even if it's, even if you, even if there's a reversal here, there has, you have to be able to justify it. We, we, uh, you know, Vatican I does, does not have a maximalist view of papal authority. Uh, it, that is to say, the Pope is not an absolute monarch. He just does, he, he doesn't just speak and therefore that's it. Nor is it a minimalist view of papal authority because the Pope can teach, doesn't have to teach, you know, in concert with all of the bishops, okay? Ideally, of course, you want that. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a moderate view of papal authority where the Pope has to, it's a constitutional papacy. The Pope has to provide a justification for the claims that he's making in the light of the authoritative sources of the faith. Uh, he doesn't, he, he, he is a custodian. He receives those sources. And so he can't just open his mouth and say, this is it. He has to provide, he has to provide a justification for it in the light of scripture, tradition. And in my view, I think what the Pope the change, as it were, that the Pope made, the reversal that he made, I don't think will stand uh, if we have a if we have a Pope uh, that comes next and 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 has a uh, you know an understanding of uh, of the teaching. I don't think the Pope's reasons for changing it uh, provide a real justification for changing it. So, but again, that's uh, it, it. A lot depends on what the status of the teaching is. Uh, what kind of authority does it have? And there, there are differences there. Sure. Uh, there are differences there. And uh, I'm not saying that all the differences are, are valid, no. But, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a consensus as to the status of that teaching. Is it infallible? Is it non-definitive? Uh, whatever. And then, of course, you have to provide reasons, even for, even for reversing yourself on this. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it's a constitutional papacy, so the, in the, so the Pope has to provide a justification for the teaching. He's not an absolute monarch. He does. He, he, the, the change has to take place when he teaches from the chair of Peter, as the universal teacher of of, uh, of Christianity. He, he, he's given some justifications for it. I, I think that they're illegitimate justifications, but well, he has given some reasons. Well, yeah, he has given reasons. The question is whether those reasons are good reasons. Right. Sure. Yeah, I don't think they are. Hopefully, we no, can do a whole episode on them. On the other hand, uh, as I said, I mean, uh, even among you know Christian scholars, uh, there's a dispute about about the, about those matters. Uh, sure. I myself, I signed the document uh, that Ed Fee, Edward Fieser asked me to sign on, on precisely this question. You know, uh, asking the, the Pope to reconsider and so on and so on, which of course always falls upon deaf ears because. Sure. He's open to criticism, except when, right. when he doesn't, when he, when he's not, which is all we. Right. right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap it up there. Um, l l let's see. Did you have any um, plugs that you want to put in for website, book, anything that you want? Go ahead and throw it out there. No, I mean, uh, you know, I did give a lecture uh, recently that I posted on my Facebook page on uh, a lecture that I'd given in uh, two, two other a public lecture that I'd given at Aquinas College and also in, in the Netherlands. Uh, at the end of November on, uh, you know, the church standing at the crossroads, the, the church and the legacy of Vatican II. So that's on my 
on, on, and didn't you write? Oh, didn't you also write something on the on the Christian worldview of Herman Bobbing? Yeah, yeah, I did write. Uh, that's coming out in the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society. Uh, Bobbing's uh, book, uh, early twentieth century book on Christian worldview. It's a, really an essay in in uh, Christian philosophy. Okay. And, uh, so that's coming out. Uh, if you go to my uh, my academia.edu a page you'll see it's it's on there as well um and of course uh you know my uh, this the revised and expanded second edition of my pope francis book uh that's uh, of course uh, yeah. uh, deals with all of this all of this stuff or you know the, the the dialogue of religions and the question of truth in and the whole matter of justification and raising the question of truth which as i've said uh, francis never raises uh and and I I I I think uh, I'm not surprised that he never raises it because he rejects he's skeptical about absolute truth and he tells us that we have to you know renounce uh, claims to uh, you know uh, that Christian beliefs alone are valid and absolute and so on and so on so of course what is, that's that's all confusing and and the reasons why he rejects absolute truth I discussed that at length uh, I have a chapter on the Morris Petitia. On, on the controverted chapter eight, which I think is uh, the uh, very problematic. But see, again, there I say, there's no way to get from John Paul II to Amoris Satizia. Uh, Veritatis Splendor is very clear. The same issues that John, that, uh, that uh, what's his name is dealing with in chapter eight uh, are dealt with in Amoris Satizia. Uh, sorry, they are dealt with uh, in Veritatis Splendor. So, in my view, there's no way to get from Vatican II to Amoris Laetitia. Uh, I think personally, and, and I've argued, I argue that in my book in the first chapter, I don't think Francis really understands uh, the Lorenian hermeneutics of Vatican II. I think his view in the end uh, is, um, is, has a particular affinity for this neo-modernism where doctrines are just... Uh, uh, pragmatic they're just uh, vehicles of uh, our experience and and so you know the whole matter of uh, uh, I discussed that as well you know the whole matter of enculturation and the law of evangelization it becomes a sort of a perpetual hermeneutics where you're 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 perpetually reinterpreting and recontextualizing the gospel and uh, and the law of evangelization can only be understood, it's stated in paragraph 44 of Gaudium et Spes, it can only be understood against the background of the Lorenian hermeneutics of, uh, that John the 23rd states in his, uh, in his opening address, which refers us back to, you know, Vatican I, 1869-70, and Vatican I is citing Vincent de Lorenz, the commandatorium primum. So, if we, you know, so does doctrine change? No, it doesn't change. Huh? Fundamental uh, doctrine, uh, remember, uh, dogmas, all dogmas are doctrines, not all doctrines are dogmas, but you can have infallible teaching, for primary and secondary objects of infallibility. The fact that they don't change uh, doesn't mean that we don't grow in our understanding that even in our understanding, look, even after the Council of Chalcedon, there were all kinds of questions about the full humanity of Christ. So, the, so yes, Vatican II is not a perfect council. Uh, did it do everything it could in stating, uh, in stating its position within, on, on a variety of, in those 16 documents? Uh, uh, I, think it, I think it did. I think the literal sense of the text was undermined by those that wanted to uh, focus on the spirit of the text, and the spirit of the text wasn't adequately realized in the in the council documents, and so they wanted to already revise. Uh, you know, Ratzinger complains about this in his me memoirs and in the theological highlights of Vatican II. Already, he said, "I come back, and people are already now talking about Vatican III." He says, "You know, um, so it seems to me the literal sense is essential." Uh, the church goes on to listen to the world. It has to. We can't. We can't possibly think that everything that uh, could have been said or should have been said uh, in that context 
uh, given that it was, uh, you know, uh, 50, uh, half a century ago, we, we, there are all kinds of issues now that the church is trying to listen to. Unfortunately, in my judgment, unfortunately, the church is also in a state of amnesia. You know, it's in a state of amnesia. It's forgotten. It's forgotten, you know, the council documents. It's forgotten the teachings of uh, John Paul II and uh, forgotten the teachings of Benedict. One can, you know, I know Francis, you know, he'll cite Benedict here and there and, and so on and so on. But it just seems to me that uh, there's something fundamentally, the church is fundamentally in crisis now, morally, doctrinally, and ecclesially. Otherwise, these things wouldn't have been happening, aren't, would, would not be happening in, in Germany, in the German Episcopacy. Uh, they've been emboldened by Francis. Yeah. And yeah. so they, can, they think they can just stick their, they can do whatever they want. You know, local. Sure. All right, excellent. This, this was a great show. Uh, we'll wrap it up here and we'll definitely plan for another one. Um, yeah, let, let's continue the discussion with the part three. I'd I'd love to do that off the air. We'll see if we could shoot you some dates. And, yeah, yeah, we, and, we, and let's continue. We're going to do one on uh, the difference between the Nouvelle Theologie and modernism. I say let's do it. Yeah. Okay. All right. right. Well, we'll shoot you some dates. Thank you so yeah. much for coming yeah. on, Dr. You're Richard welcome. Maria. You're welcome. Yeah, You're it was welcome. a pleasure to have you. Uh, you know, in the heated conversations, we get heated. I enjoy it. <laughs> no, this, this is uh, no, this is. Uh, it's needed. Yeah, it really <laughs> what, is. <laughs> what, 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 what we don't need anymore is the, um, uh, you know, the Teletubby type, you oh, know, yeah. together. No. <laughs> Teletubby. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> singing kumbaya yeah no yeah not at all oh, yeah. Well, again we'll 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 put a plug in it there we'll, oh, I, I have to go okay. here in a second but yeah. again novel theology and the new mo and modernism yeah. let's do it all right so we'll do get it. some dates to you okay. um off the all air right. again thank you for coming on enjoy the rest of the advent season and merry christmas and a happy new year Likewise. Thank all you. Right. Take care, brothers. Take all care. Right. Everybody, thank you for watching. Please comment, like, subscribe, share this material on your social media. Till next time, go share your faith.